presentation. All right. Hey, hi, guys. Uh, nice to see all of you interested on a Monday evening. So welcome. I'm Saranya, uh, based here in Singapore, and I'm part of Microsoft's uh, distributed database uh, team called the Azure Cosmos Database. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Our today's session really is, uh, and uh, what, uh, uh, Isha, we have, what, about 30 minutes, give or take? Is Yes. All right. You just uh, prompt me and, you know, just go ahead and cut me off if you think. Okay, we'll do it. All right. So uh, I guess today is more to give you guys an overview of uh, uh, understanding the world of distributed computing, uh, potential opportunities and where their relevance lies. Um, personally, it's an area that I've been uh, very fascinated with, uh, just to kind of give you an example, for the last five years plus, I've uh, been kind of just following uh, Leslie Lamport, who's uh, uh, more to be called as the father of uh, distributed computing, uh, and came up with multiple kinds of consensus algorithms and papers that's been coming out. A very interesting field, if you guys are interested to go and look at it, like your weekend time pass reads and hobbies. Uh, end of today's session, I'll probably also give you some uh, latest pointers, uh, YouTube videos that's been come out from uh, US universities. Because of the COVID, they've put all of their whole distributed computing semester sessions up online. And um, I went through it myself, and I'm sure you guys will enjoy it as well. Okay, so uh, usually key takeaways are set up at the end of uh, discussion, but I thought uh, junior dev, uh, today's uh, youngsters probably want to know what they're getting in for for the next uh, 25 minutes or so, right? So I kind of did a quick uh, rundown of what we want to talk right now. Uh, distributed systems are complex. Uh, it's hard work to work with it. So the net net starting point of this whole conversation is don't go to choose distributed computing or distributed systems if uh, you can avoid it, right? Uh, so uh, it's not a fancy or it's not something like cool to go ahead and do. If you can just run things out of a single system, single machine, single node, single database, single queue, single message, single ledger, whatever be it, just go and do it. Uh, distributed systems will involve a lot of hard work that kind of come into it as you go along with it, right? Uh, they're chosen basically based on uh, necessity to scale. Uh, as you know, scaling is either scale up or scale out. Uh, scale up, you know, has a upper limit or a benchmark. Scale out, and you architect well for scaling out, you kind of know that you have this option to add on multiple computing power and things just work like magic. So uh, it's chosen by a necessity of scale and uh, price. Uh, we will talk a little bit about the CAP theorem uh, for those of you uh, college uh, students would probably have been familiar with CAP uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And that distributed computing uh, encompasses various categories, right? Uh, probably won't have time to talk about each of the categories in detail, uh, but uh, clearly top on the chart is databases, data stores. Uh, there's also computing nodes, like how can I run big data crunching? Uh, and then various kinds of file system storage. Uh, there are messaging systems, ledgers, and kind of applications as well, right? Like even if you look at a web application hosted on 10 servers and you're creating a stateless web app that kind of maps into uh, some sort of a distributed front end, so to speak, right? Uh, in a very simplistic format. So that's where we are heading to today as we talk about it. Okay, what is distributed computing? Uh, distributed computing? Uh, or distributed systems is systems running on several nodes. Uh, nodes could be VMs, bare metal machines, so on and so forth. Uh, distributed systems are connected by network, uh, which means that they are characterized by partial failure, uh, failures in terms of uh, network bandwidth or a, a bad uh, or a malicious worker on the uh, network, so on and so forth. And they are also characterized by unbounded latency just because you don't know when you're going to get the bits or things are going on the network and just because the latency is not like a bounded latency. Right? So uh, identifying our uh, protocols to work in these distributed systems need different kinds of parameters. By that, what I mean is uh, a global clock might just not work in a distributed system. 
because there's no concept of this. So in distributed system, if you're interested, we won't touch up on this too much, but what you have is called vector clocks um, and uh, various characteristics of how those vector clocks can uh, create some sort of a, a precedence order or order of events. So uh, the distributed systems have uh, an idea of the way the systems work. So uh, those are the things that happen, right? But simply put in simple English, for you and I, a distributed system is a group of computers. Uh, they're working together. They give you a seamless uh, feel that you're just working with single computer uh, to an end user, right? Uh, they have shared state. Uh, each of these nodes or each of these different computers operate concurrently. They're fairly independently. They can fail independently, uh, so on and so forth. So that's that's really about what distributed computing is. And why did it even emerge and what's the real use case of it? Uh, as we said, scaling horizontally uh, gives you a lot of uh, ease in which you can actually scale out by just adding another machine or putting some compute and storage power and things just work as magic. And that is uh, possible only in a distributed system because then you can actually scale potentially to infinite space of how much ever you want, both computing and storage, right? But that's a math to it. The second bullet that you see here, uh, heavy workloads on this graph side, you would see that there's a tipping point where uh, you could, you do not pro potentially need uh, distributed computing or you're not going to be super beneficial. Uh, the costs associated for setting up the distributed computing will outweigh the ROI or the rewards that you return. So this this quick thing about how much extra capacity is needed versus what is price per capacity unit and only beyond a particular tipping when you have more capacity needed is when you will see the solid line that you see here after the tipping point is much uh, more manageable. It's not exponential curve that you see potentially in a single system where you want to scale up, right? Uh, so these are all the motivation of uh, why distributed computing has come up with. Uh, also situations around fault tolerance, things like, uh, hey, how can I uh, ensure uh, I can have uh, in the very simplistic basic thing, how can I have disaster recovery, high availability baked in into my core architecture as opposed to having a backup DR as another separate service component, like uh, those kinds of tolerance systems. Uh, systems also in the network layer, uh, message packet losses, consensus concepts, and those kinds of tolerances as well. Uh, finally, uh, latency issues are also pretty uh, significant that can be resolved by distributed computing. So for example, the fact that it's distributed, users can go ahead and access those computing endpoints that's the closest to them. Because you see, you can't uh, cheat uh, physics, right? You can't beat the speed of light, if you know what I mean. Uh, speed of light is the fastest moving object in the universe that we have seen. Right. Uh, that being said, uh, packet transfers are nowhere close to the speed of light. Right? But how can we simulate uh, millisecond latencies if we want our responses to our websites, web applications? One way to simulate millisecond latencies is bring the computing power, both compute and storage, to the users, as opposed to take the users to the data or the compute, which is what the traditional uh, client server model works, right? So that kind of really brings down, tools down to micro second latencies. Uh, those are interesting concepts as we're talking. So uh, for the junior dev, I kind of just wrote down these uh, pictures just before the session. So I thought it looks kind of uh, interesting and cool and get some uh, spice. But essentially what we will do right now in the next 10 minutes is uh, let's go through a practical example of a distributed, say a database, uh, just to pick it as an example. And so we can understand what we are talking about in terms of distributed systems uh, in general. So the first step one, uh, consider a two tier architecture. Uh, front end could be a web, file, a web mobile app. Uh, back end is the database system. Literally, right? It's one node, one node, single system. Uh, step two, Let's assume that the users read request or the number of users, transactions, the number of users are just increasing, number of reads are increasing. Uh, one thing that we can do is to go ahead and say, let's replicate 
the backend database to multiple copies just so that the users can now read from any copy that they want and that's your replication strategy so in this picture it's as simple as i'm inserting a property a1 with a value a in database one however i can select uh, the user where a1 equal to a either from database b or c uh, not uh, uh, it's a no-brainer for us to understand that this is something that is very much existent today. Talk of various NoSQL databases out there, right? Uh, but the biggest uh, interesting concept here is data is replicated, so that is replication. And what are the pitfalls or practical issues with replication? It's a trade-off, right? There's a huge CAP theorem trade-off, and that's where we're heading to after this. Uh, just bear in mind, uh, if you guys are not familiar with CAP, uh, we'll do a quick run of that. But if you do, then I guess you kind of know what I'm talking about. Uh, but also the practical issue is this is going to support multiple reads. Like everyone wants to read, then they can go to various databases and read. However, in the previous picture, we are kind of assuming the writes are happening to the central DB1 while the reads are being propagated to uh, all the other cells. Uh, the interesting concept is DB1 then becomes a bottleneck or the limiting parameter, right? Uh, for which uh, introduces the next concept in the distributed uh, world of, uh, of storage or stores mm -hmm. is sharding or partitioning. So you probably want to partition your DB1 here that you see on your screens into various physical shards like partition one, partition two, and partition three here. So then the web app now knows that uh, and you can you can hash it and you could go some sort of consistent hashing to say which partition needs to be accessed for what kind of partition key ranges and so on and so forth. But net net is if the web app in our previous case, if the value of A1 is A, so it's kind of alphabet. If it's from A to K, it goes to P1, K to P, it goes to P2 and P to C, it goes to P3. So this concept is called sharding. So in typical distributed computing, you have at one point shards, and then you have another point replication. So imagine in this picture, assuming that you have four replication of every data for high availability, and you kind of have three shards, then automatically you have about 12 of nodes, physical nodes, and these need to now work as if they are single machine. Not to speak about global replication, meaning if this is your high availability setup, say in Singapore, and you have someone from Australia saying, hey, I want the similar setup there, then this setup needs to be another replicated for global distribution in another location. And both of these now have to work as if they're a single computing unit. Very fascinating if you see how things work through these. So uh, before this, so this is more like just a teaser for you guys to kind of think about distributed computing. But uh, any talk or any conversation about distributed computing isn't uh, uh, complete or even not started if you don't really talk about what is this CAP theorem, C-A-P, uh, stands for consistency. By consistency, I mean, if you have your data replicated in two databases, are those data exactly the same? or because it's going to take time or lag to replicate, how much lag is that going to be saved? So are they inconsistent? So that's your consistency. There's availability, which means, uh, is your data going to be available or is the system going to say, wait, let me complete all of the full replication before the client gets the hack back to say, uh, your uh, transaction or your, your process is done. So in simple English, if you're going to Facebook and you're going and in, in posting a comment on Facebook, the application is available for you to go and do something else, right? Uh, that will be more like availability is prioritized. On the other hand, if it's more like, let me actually go and deploy in all the other replicas for Facebook to ensure that the data is fully replicated before the end user's application uh, is going to be available for the, his next user input. That means the application is not available. Like I'm just giving you like really the basics here. So that's your consistency, that's your availability. And then partitioning is sharding that we said. So the CAP theorem basically says you can have two out of these three. So you can either have consistency 
and availability of your data given uh, that partition like you have to you have to trade two off uh, you can't have all the three right so you can have maximum two out of the three now what is interesting is in a distributed computing world the whole fact that the system being distributed means partitioning is given or taken meaning you have to have a partitioned system that's why it's a distributed system uh, then your trade-off eventually is between consistency of your data versus how available is your data for example here we have uh, three different regions uh, west us east us north europe just for the sake of conversation right and in each of those you have four copies or four replicas of your storage for example right and then each of the four is replicated in these three so this is exactly the story that i'm talking about here right uh, now so the interesting piece here is let's say there is a value five in one uh, in one region a and then at the start all of the regions have the same value five for a particular item or a storage item now the user comes and updates value five to value six uh, and of course that needs to go and get propagated to your other regions right and it probably propagates say to the other part of the us but it fails in the europe region a network uh, disruption happens so one has six another has five eventually what does region b users read in this case what will those users read they will go to go to go ahead and read five while the users in region c here are going to go ahead and read six uh, but the actual value is six so this is what we call as uh, inconsistency right uh, so your story is uh, as i said how do you prioritize uh, do i wait for all the regions to get updated and uh, acknowledgements received back to the leader before the leader confirms uh, that will be a very strongly consistent system that strong consistency uh, whereas on the other end of the spectrum what you call as eventual consistency is when you kind of know eventually the system will be consistent but any point in time uh, you probably will have stale data right so that's the other side of the spectrum uh, interesting papers uh, are there where various other consistency models are there, something called session state consistency, where every user sees monotonic reads and monotonic writes. By that, what I mean is whatever I write, I will read it in the correct, exactly same order. Right? So that is one sort of consistency. And then there are various other closer to strong, closer to eventual, so on and so forth. But in this picture, in this diagram, the intent of showing you is not to talk about inconsistencies, while that is very interesting as well, is to kind of say that the CAP theorem tells us that whenever, uh, uh, for example, a network disruption happens, then you have to trade off between how consistent you want your systems to be versus how available your systems want to be. But in reality, if the systems will just work naturally well. Right? They do not need to have a network consistency. It's just the packets are taking a long time. It's just slower. So there's no network disruption, but there's network latency. So there's another interesting uh, academic uh, term here called uh, PACELC. Uh, it's basically saying, given that partitioning is there for distributed computing, so P is given, it's taken. So your trade-off is between A and C, which is availability and consistency. Otherwise, your trade-off is between latency and consistency. So it's not really about availability, but it's just, just your system is slow, right? So you don't want your system to be slow. So, uh, so those are interesting trade-offs that people have to work with and uh, teeth out with. And that's a very core point of distributed computing. I took the example of database here, but this is really across all systems and all computing companies. And then here's like a, a a reuse of a slide that I have, and it says Cosmos DB here, but uh, today's intent not to talk of Cosmos DB, but I thought the slide is interesting because it kind of brings in terminologies in one uh, picture or one word. So uh, all of us familiar with SQL world, uh, relational data components, and they are governed by asset properties, atomicity, consistency, isolated uh, 
and then uh, durable durability right uh, while no sql data components like mongodb couchdb cassandra cosmos db dynamo db so on and so forth uh, we are governed by what uh, we say it's not 100% true but what we call as no sql components are governed by base by basically available uh, talks focus on replication core uh, soft state which means the data is uh, uh, transient uh, in a way but eventually consistent right the system is consistent eventually depending on your level of your acceptable level of staleness that you want and you can decide your staleness level to say that hey i want last 10 seconds data slay or the last 20 operations of stale so that kind of uh, interesting trade-offs can also be brought in uh, what is interesting is uh, the Consistency in the SQL world really talks about uh, uh, consistency of a single node or a single uh, point. However, uh, when you talk of the distributed world, the consistency is across various nodes. It's not data durability, it's not data integrity within a transaction commitment, but it's really about uh, multiple nodes and consistency of the system as such. And then there is this interesting world of today's world called new SQL. If you haven't heard, I would encourage you to go and take a look at it. Bringing the goodness of uh, SQL, uh, no SQL world, because no SQL uh, world has its own plus points, but how can I add certain uh, asset uh, characters to no SQL world? So that's just more like a, a plug here to talk about terms for you to go and look out for later as well, right? Trying to be cognizant of the time as we talk and uh, uh, for completeness we have to bring in other concepts of distributed computing what we saw in today's session really was uh, about uh, database stores because uh, that's one area that uh, you will see anytime you go and look for distributed computing the first examples that hit you on the face and that makes total sense is uh, the heartbeat of any system, like data is the king kind of a thing, right? Like how can I access the data that I have in a very consistent, reliable, efficient, uh, fault tolerant uh, fashion, right? So that's the first piece. Outside of that uh, distributed computing, uh, in the olden world, uh, world you used to have these algorithms called MapReduce. Uh, you can unlearn, you don't need to unlearn, relearn that. There are better architectures like the Lambda architectures, Kappa architectures coming up right now. But uh, just to kind of say that, how can I uh, compute, uh, crunch my data across multiple nodes in an efficient way? For example, in Lambda event-driven architecture, we will talk about a batch layer and a speed layer of access. Uh, batch layer is more about taking your data uh, and your compute request in batches and you're performing that um, through a cold path of access. Uh, speed layer is more about real-time uh, data ingestions being triggered as events and responses being uh, spit out. Uh, so those kinds of uh, situations where your computing channel is now distributed. So that's your distributed computing. Similarly, you would have also come across distributed file systems. Uh, HDFS is a Hadoop uh, data file system is pretty uh, prevalent in the last decade. Uh, this decade, I'm seeing IPFS uh, more around uh, uh, using consensus protocols for uh, file system coordinations. Uh, those are interesting concepts for us to see as well. Uh, distributed messaging uh, is another category people have kind of it's got its own niche uh, in terms of how can I have multiple channels channel URIs and queues and then subscribers reading from their respective queues so Kafka topics and Kafka's is a very um, uh, prevalent in this space uh, again uh, various other messaging queues are available uh, finally, distributed applications, uh, uh, last but not the least, right, even when we talk about our microservices based architectures that we see, uh, those are classic examples of uh, distributed archi archi uh, applications, front end applications, which uh, are creating stateless 
balancing application uh, node and the context across nodes and so on and so forth. I can speak from Microsoft side because uh, many of the Microsoft services use Service Fabric, which is a microservice based uh, uh, load balancing uh, unit clustering. Uh, for example, uh, I'm from Cosmos DB and they use Service Fabric. Our IoT teams use uh, Service Fabrics and so on and so forth. But there are distributed uh, application rings available outside. One of a common example for open source folks is BitTorrent, right? How does uh, that work across? Uh, you can see the uh, the app computing is now distributed across various front end nodes to perform various tasks. Uh, didn't have time to go through that, but that's an interesting topic as well. Uh, last but not the least, uh, distributed ledgers uh, across blockchain, uh, kind of blockchain based uh, data storages. Uh, that's also coming up big time. Uh, yeah, won't go into that as well. Uh, but if you have questions, I'm happy to take maybe one or two. I've been talking for a while now. Uh, but I just wanted to leave you guys to say that there are a lot to learn here. We've just touched the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you have a couple of things to do. At one level, if you're interested on the technical nuances, this is your page. You have to, you can go and look at how does consensus algorithms work? Uh, how do consistencies uh, sort it? What are various replication strategies? What are fault models, failure tolerance, acceptance limits? Uh, then how do messages broadcast across networks? How are broadcast message events ordered? For example, in the distributed world, uh, just because you're receiving an event doesn't mean you're delivering the event in the system. So they will receive the event, look at the vector, vector clock. They will ensure that the clock they have uh, is uh, either uh, lower, for example, than the clock of the receiving message. So they have various, I'm just simplifying this. But in that way, then they will either deliver it to say I'm opening my box it's like getting your mail in your actual mail and you're actually removing or cutting it on reading your sync post mail and you're opening the letter and seeing it. Or you can receive the letter and say, I don't want to open it until I get the previous letter in the right order. So those kinds of event ordering concepts are very interesting. And then latency considerations and trade-offs. So these are really the technical jobs and nuances. Now, there are interesting business conversations that you can go and look out for as well uh, in this distributed computing world. So, uh, so those will relate to what are the main industries uh, where you see uh, more need than less. What could be the various scenarios and user personas which need more? Because as I said, I want to conclude the session by saying you do not want to use distributed computing uh, when you can avoid it. If there's even a small chance of not even falling prey to this and getting the ROI and what you want to do without entering into the world of distributed computing, the good choice is to stay away from it. But uh, today's world, huge amounts of data being assimilated, you want to be, and huge number of users and real-time data access being set up and cloud, public clouds are built in distributed uh, systems. It's a very interesting topic to keep a tab on. Right. So uh, happy to ask the questions now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Saranya. Uh, folks, we have maybe five minutes for questions. So I think there's one from Avis here. Uh, just to get an expert opinion from outside the cult, what's your opinion of SAP HANA database? Does it live up to its hype? Does it scale out well? What products would Yeah, so SAP uh, HANA is an in-memory uh, but at the same time, they have uh, it's a really beefy machines. Uh, uh, they try to bring in uh, they uh, they try to bring in this concept of uh, without saying so. They try to bring in this concept of hedge tap, uh, which is more like hybrid transactional analytical processing uh, systems. Uh, sheer market share of various kinds of modules, CRM, ERP modules that can run on HANA, make it so much useful for us uh, to host on HANA, right? That way you can do CRUD operations on them. At the same time, you can even do uh, batch uh, operations on them. Uh, very good store. Very expensive though, yeah? Uh, meaning uh, uh, it, it is more an enterprise offering. You probably know it. So um, yeah, good one. Thanks. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Amos. 
from Jason. Uh, was curious, is microservice application uh, will be a norm in the future and worth to invest in, or is it just a hype at the moment of time? Uh, no, it's not a hype. Uh, but jargons can be sounded as hype. But if you open the jargon, peel the onion, and see what's actually in there, uh, it's pretty simplistic and basic to understand. Uh, so uh, if you look at uh, client server, and then you kind of went to SOA, service-oriented architecture, and then you went now to microservices architecture, the jargons can be daunting. But essentially what it says is uh, in service oriented architecture, your whole business process, business units, uh, functionalities will be separated and isolated into separate systems of holding. Uh, in microservices architectures, the separation is more granular. Uh, by more granular, what I mean is even one single module, like in your online uh, web application, uh, retail application, say you have product catalog systems, you have a checkout system, you have social sharing system. Uh, so you do a lot of things on your online website, lazada.sg, right? So now in microservices, the uh, intent is each of these smaller modules uh, can be load balanced within even one container nodes. And uh, so the interesting additions is you have a health checker you have a you know heartbeat uh, and revival checker some sort of uh, data structures at the back end to maintain the uh, stateless and stateful workers so that you're able to allocate uh, it's going to be there for sure uh, definitely be there the thing is it might become easier a lot of things might be abstracted away you know have apis to get it but uh, yeah um, it's not going away well. Maybe, maybe uh, Michael, that's a good topic for us to pick up in the next, <laughs> next meetup. Let's talk more about microservices and domain uh, design. Sounds good. Cool. If anyone wants to talk about it, reach out to Michael and me. All right. Any other questions for Saranya? You can always reach out to her on Twitter. Twitter handle is on the screen right now. Yes, yes, sure. We'll stop sharing. And uh, Isha, thank you for the opportunity. Michael, nice to know you. And a lot of these guys on call. Uh, uh, good luck and uh, lovely to be a part of this conversation today. Thank you so much for coming and speaking to us about distributed computing and this broad world of so many words that we've only heard so far and maybe a little more detail. It was really good. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, maybe we can move on.